So there are a number of verses in the Quran that say something along the lines of, uh, no bearer of burden shall bear the burden of another. There's a bunch of these. Let's look at one. Chapter 6, verse 164 of the Quran. Say, what? <laughs> Is that saying what? <laughs> Say, what? Shall I seek a Lord other than Allah? And He is the Lord of all things. And no soul earns evil but against itself. And no bearer of burden shall bear the birth of another. So a Muslim looks at it. You see, in Islam, no bearer of burden is going to bear the burden of another. You bear your own burden of sins. No one else is going to bear your burden for you. So Islam is a just system. Christianity isn't. Now, that's how the objection arises. I can think of at least three problems uh, from the Muslim sources with Muslims using this verse, or the, the other verse. They all, they all say the same thing. They all say, no bearer of burden shall bear the burden of another. I think of three important uh, objections to this objection. Let's look at some. First, the Quran actually contradicts itself a bit on this point. Because in some passages, other people will bear the burdens of others. So let's look at an example here. Chapter 16, verses 22 through 25. Your God is one God. So as for those who do not believe in the hereafter, their hearts are ignorant and they are proud. Truly Allah knows what they hide and what they manifest. Surely he does not love the proud. And when it is said to them, what is it that your Lord has revealed? They say, stories of the ancients, that they may bear their burdens entirely on the day of resurrection, and also the burdens of those whom they lead astray without knowledge. And this actually makes sense, right? This makes sense, right? You've led other people astray, you're going to bear some of their burden. But notice, some people are going to be bearing, bearing the burdens of, of other people. If you've led people astray, you're going to bear some of their burdens. So the Quran is not absolute on this issue. In fact, it's interesting. Sometimes the Quran can't go two verses without contradicting itself on this point. So check out this passage. Chapter 29, verses 12 to 13. Check out, read verse 12, read verse 13. Watch this. And those who disbelieve say to those who believe, disbelievers are saying to the believers, follow our path and we will bear your wrongs. So follow us, we'll bear, we'll bear your sins, right? So, Follow our path, and we will bear your wrongs. And never shall they be the bearers of any of their wrongs. Are they ever going to bear any of their wrongs? What? Never shall they be the bearers of any of their wrongs. Most surely they are liars. Next verse. And most certainly they shall carry their own burdens and other burdens with their own burdens. And most certainly they shall be question on the day of resurrection as to what they forged. So, I don't know if verse 13 abrogates verse 12. I don't know what the situation here is. But not, not, the Quran isn't the most consistent book in the world. Jay talks about Quran contradictions before. Um, all right, so that would be point number one. The Quran is not entirely consistent on this. So, to Muslims, you would say, aha, look what, chapter 6, verse 164. It says right there, no bearer of burden shall bear the burden of another. Well, not sure about that. Might want to interpret that in the, in, in the light of other verses which certainly make at least some exceptions to that teaching. So that's one problem. Second problem, as always, is Muhammad. <laughs> <laughs> you see, Muhammad walks around teaching, everyone, you're going to have to face your own sins. you gotta, you got to deal with your own burden of sin. No one's going to pay that for you. Allah can forgive you if he wants, but no one's paying for any of your sins. But people started coming up to Muhammad. Muhammad, you have no idea how much I've sinned. I've sinned a lot. I understand that Allah is not completely just, and he can just sweep some sins under the rug. He can just let some sins slide. Because unlike the Christian God, his justice is not perfect. But I sin so much, I don't see how Allah can just let my sins slide. I've got a lot of them. Horrible, horrible things. So the objections kept coming to Muhammad. But as always, Muhammad came up with a solution. These are multiple Sahih narrations in one of Islam's two most trusted sources on the teachings of Muhammad. Sahih Muslim, read four passages. 
Sahih Muslim 6665. Allah's Messenger said, when it will be the day of resurrection, Allah would deliver to every Muslim, a Jew or a Christian, and say, that is your rescue from hellfire. You say, what, Muhammad? I don't know, bear a burden, bear the burden of another here. Allah's going to deliver to every Muslim, a Christian or a Jew, and say, that's your rescue from hellfire. Now, how is that going to rescue Muslims from hellfire? Let's keep reading. So, hey, Muslim, 6666. And for those of you who are like, oh, it's 666. No, it's not, right? It's just a, if, you've got, if, you've got, if you've got this many things, something is going to be that number, right? <laughs> Allah's apostle said, no Muslim would die, but Allah would admit in his stead a Jew or a Christian in hellfire. Is that what Muslims tell you? Your Muslim friends tell you this? That... God's going to deliver you to Muslims, admit you into hell, in the place of Muslims who've done horrible, horrible things. Let's keep reading. Mm -hmm. Sahih Muslim 6668. Allah's Messenger said, There would come people amongst the Muslims on the day of resurrection with as heavy sins as a mountain. And Allah would forgive them, and he would place in their stead the Jews and the Christians. Muhammad, I murdered like 80,000 people. Man, no problem. Allah will just punish those Jews and Christians for what you've done. Allah will forgive you. Interesting, right? This is what's cool, right? No Muslim you ever meet knows this. If you're talking to a, you know, a high-level Muslim scholar, he'll be aware of this. But your average Muslim who's telling you, ah, Horrible and unjust for God to punish one person for something that these other people did. Really? Thank you for just admitting that Muhammad's a false prophet. Because this is what you, what, what you just condemned is exactly what Muhammad taught. One more. It's from 110 Ahadith Qudsi. Number eight. Allah's Messenger said. So now we have it all explained here how this works. Allah's Messenger said. On the day of resurrection, my ummah, Muslim community, will be gathered into three groups. One sort will enter paradise without rendering an account of their deeds. You just need to walk in. I have to explain anything. Another sort will be reckoned an easy account and admitted into paradise. Yet another sort will, count, will come bearing on their backs heaps of sins like great mountains. These are bad, bad people. Allah will ask the angels, though he knows best about them, who are these people? They will reply, they are humble slaves of yours. Humble slaves of yours! They got sins as heavy as a mountain on their backs, right? But they're never little less humble slaves of yours. He will say, unload the sins from them and put the same over the Jews and Christians. Then let the humble slaves get into paradise by virtue of my mercy. So your Muslim friend who says it's, it's unjust, it's unfair, it's wicked, it's immoral for God to punish one person for what someone else did. Sorry, you need another prophet. Because you've just condemned Muhammad. But it doesn't stop there. One more thing. Let's take a look at what this actually says. Because a Muslim reads this and says, you see, in Islam, no bearer of burden shall bear the burden of another. No one can bear your burden of sins. Now look closely. Does this say no one can bear your burden of sins? No. Not what it says, does it? It says no bearer of burden is going to bear your burden of sins. Let's talk about a burden of sins here, right? So this isn't saying no one can bear your burden of sins. It's saying no one who already has a burden of sin is going to bear your burdens. In other words, that such a person, if you've got a burden of sins, you're in no, you're in no place to stand before God and say, hey, you know, God, I'm gonna, I've got my own burden of sins, but I'm going to take this too. You're in no position to do something like that. So what does this verse leave wide open? Someone who has no burden of sin. Voluntarily, voluntarily taking your burden upon 
someone who, according to both Christianity and Islam, was sinless, we might have a solution to the problem of sin, ladies and gentlemen. We might have reconciliation with God. If only, if only Christians and Muslims could agree on someone who is without sin. Is it Muhammad? According to Christianity, it's not Muhammad? Is it Muhammad according to Islam? Uh, you all study, don't you? <laughs> the reason that's important is your average Muslim will your average Muslim will either believe that Muhammad was free of sin or at least free of all major sin. But your average Muslim will, will usually say Muhammad was sinless, and they'll say that the prophets in general. So, is that what the Muslim sources say? Check this out. Chapter 40, verse 55 of the Quran. Therefore, be patient, O Muhammad, for the promise of Allah is true, and ask forgiveness for your sin. Whoops. <laughs> and sing the praises of your Lord in the evening and in the morning. Wow. Chapter 47, verse 19. So know, O Muhammad, that there is no God but Allah, and ask forgiveness for your sin and for the believing men and the believing women. For Allah knows how you move about and how you dwell at home. Allah knows what you're doing at home. Allah sees what you're doing. He knows when you've been naughty. <laughs> and what's he say? Muhammad, I see you all the time. Ask forgiveness for your sins. 48, 1 through 2. Surely we have given you a clear victory, O Muhammad, that Allah may forgive your sins that are past and those to come. So you've already sinned in the past and you're going to sin in the future. And may complete his favor to you and may guide you on a right path. So Muhammad had already sinned and he was going to sin some more. Muhammad sinless, according to the Quran. So he's sinless according to the Hadith. Sahih al Bukhari, 6307. Muhammad said, By Allah, I seek Allah's forgiveness and turn to him in repentance more than 70 times a day. <laughs> 70 times a day? That's like every 20 minutes, day and night. What is this guy doing? <laughs> what is he doing? I don't know anyone who sins that much, right? That's the sinless prophet that the average Muslim believes in, right? Not sinless according to his most trusted sources. What about Jesus? Surah 19, verses 16 to 19. And make mention of Mary in the book, when she had withdrawn from her people to an eastern place, and took a veil to screen herself from them. Then we said to her, Our spirit, and it assumed for her the likeness of a perfect man. She said, Lo, I seek refuge in the beneficent one from you, if you fear God. He said, I am only a messenger of your Lord, and I may give you a faultless son. Sahih al-Bukhari, 3286. The prophet said, when any human being is born, Satan touches him at both sides of the body with his two fingers, except Jesus, the son of Mary, whom Satan tried to touch but failed. So he touched the placenta cover instead. All the people, all the men, all the prophets, everyone, Satan couldn't touch Jesus, not according to me, according to Muhammad. And the question is, why would that be, right? Jesus is a, you know, he, he's another prophet, one of a thousand. Really, why is Jesus so radically different from everyone, including Muhammad? Go ahead and ask forgiveness pretty much every 20 minutes. Why is Jesus the one that Satan couldn't touch? You see, Satan not being able to touch Jesus makes sense from a Christian perspective. It makes no sense from a Muslim perspective. It makes no sense. You ask a Muslim why, right? the way Allah wanted it. There's no reason, there's no explanation. Not just for this, we're talking virgin birth, uh, the miracles of Jesus, him being the Messiah, him returning to judge. None of this makes sense that this man is this unique in so many ways for no reason whatsoever. But this Islamic perspective, this is where, this is where Christians and Muslims can actually agree on something. Hebrews 4.15, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to, to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. 1 Peter 2, 21 to 22, to this you are called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. 
1 John 3, 5, but you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins, and in him is no sin. So here's what's interesting. According to both Christianity and Islam, there is precisely one person in all of history who could bear the burdens of others. The message of Christianity is that the one person who could bear the burdens of others did bear the burdens of Amen. others. Amen. The message of Islam is that the one person ever who could bear the burdens of others didn't, leaving us in a constant state of anxiety, hopelessness, hoping for a way to reach God, since no one can bear our burdens. Unless, of course, we you know, believe Muhammad, who said that Allah is going to punish Jews and Christians for our sins. But in Islam, by rejecting, by rejecting the Christian claim and the claim of Jesus himself, that he was coming uh, to give his life as a ransom for many, by rejecting that, they have simply a completely incoherent account of salvation and a completely incoherent view of Jesus. They have a completely incoherent account of salvation because they have to say, no one can bear the burdens of others, but some will bear the burdens of others, and that would be horribly unjust, but Allah is going to do it over and over again, and Allah is going to deliver to every, every Muslim, a Christian or a Jew, to pay for his mountain of sins. It's completely incoherent, contradicting itself. And the view of Jesus. He's just a prophet, even though he's completely unique in every possible way that makes no sense in our view. So just think about this, right? Your average Muslim knows nothing I just said, except maybe, maybe that they view Jesus as sinless, maybe that we view Jesus as sinless, and that the Quran in some way says that no one's going to bear the burdens of others. That's, that, that, that's, that's, the, that's as far as their knowledge goes of what Islam teaches and what Christianity teaches. So just imagine a world, imagine a world where Christians are familiar with a couple of passages of the Quran and a couple of passages from the Hadith and are able to point out, hey, the Quran is actually contradictory on this point. Maybe you shouldn't have the level of confidence that you were having when you were condemning this. If they know the passages from the Hadith so that they can say, hey, you just, you just said that this is awful and immoral and a God who would do this is wicked and evil. You just condemned your own prophet and his God. And who can take all of that and then transition to a gospel message, namely that both religions leave one possibility open. And your view is that the one person who could do it didn't do it. And our view is that the one person who could do it did do it? Who do you think has a higher view of Jesus? Yes. Very good.